Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our lecture today. I hope you all are doing well and healthy out there and um, getting through this corona lockdown. So today we're going to be uh, wrapping up our discussion of Titan, the icy moon of Saturn, as well as talking about Enceladus a little bit, one of the other moons of Saturn, and... Um, yeah, generally wrapping up our talk of icy moons in general, and then we will spend a little bit of time at the end of today's lecture uh, discussing chemical reactions and how uh, they can provide energy for life. So, let's go ahead and get started. S here uh, is a picture of the Huygens lander. So this was a small probe um, that was carried uh, atop the Cassini spacecraft that went to Saturn. And this Huygens probe was dropped down with a parachute through Titan's atmosphere. And it landed on the surface and took some pictures. You can see a picture over here um, taken by the Huygens probe. And that is, uh, yeah, the view that it could see. It did a little bit of sampling of the soil, got some great pictures of the atmosphere. So um, one thing you'll notice here is that there are smooth, what looks like rocks here, except for these are made of ice, water ice. And I'll put rocks in quotes because they look and behave like rocks here at Titan, but they're made out of water ice. And they're smooth because they've been tumbled in some fluid, some liquid. Just like if you go to the river or the ocean here on Earth, you will find nice, smooth, rounded rocks uh, because they've been tumbling and ground down into that round shape. So here's the probe. This is a lander. It was not a rover. It could not drive around. Um, but yeah, so what we're seeing here generally at Titan geologically is that we're seeing a lot of geology that's very similar to Earth. Um, we see uh, sand dunes that are made out of hydrocarbons. Um, I don't have a picture of those here, um, but you could Google those and take a look. I believe there's some pictures in your book. Um, but generally we're seeing geography similar to Earth. And you can see that in this picture uh, right here that I just uh, pointed an arrow to, um, that we see coasts, rivers, tributaries. Um, you can see that here in this picture. It looks, this could be a coastline anywhere on Earth. Uh, you see some islands, um, some little inlets where the rivers are going in. Here's a nice picture where you can see, let me switch my color real quick. You can see this river going up and small tributaries coming off of it. Um, these are branching off into smaller and smaller tributaries. Uh, the coastline looks very earth-like. Uh, you can see little peninsulas and islands. Um, yeah, and that is actually a liquid, except for here, these are um, methane and ethane, not water. So these uh, liquids out here at Titan, methane and ethane, um, the only reasons they're liquids is because it's very cold. These things are gases at Earth's temperatures and pressures. So even though they look very similar, uh, they behave uh, very differently than water. So here's a question coming up for you guys. Um, based off of what we know and what we see, what type of life might we expect at Titan? Um, yeah, so the large amount of liquids at the surface means that life would be abundant when we have liquids here on Earth, we get abundant life, like around oceans and rivers. Um, there may be a subsurface ocean with life on volcanic vents. There's a thick nitrogen-rich atmosphere, like here on Earth. Does that mean we would have life similar to Earth? Maybe all of the above. 
Think about this quietly on your own and please push pause. All right, so the correct answer here is B. So the problem with some of these other answers is that there is very little energy available for life. We talked about this at Europa um, because the sunlight is so weak there and also the thick ice. Um, well, the sunlight is even weaker here. And so um, there's not going to be enough life for abundant photosynthetic um, things to happen, photosynthetic processes. But black smokers in a subsurface ocean might support life. We see that here on Earth, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the chemical reactions um, that might be taking place, or the types of chemical reactions. So, a um, couple things I want to point out before we go. These liquids at the surface, I mentioned this before, are ethane and methane, not water, and they are not energetic enough to support complex life. Uh, unlike oxygen, remember we talked about the rise of oxygen here on Earth and how the energetic reactions from oxygen, uh, the redox reactions, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, those things can support complex life. But um, ethane and methane um, don't have a lot of energy associated with them. And so we might get what's called slow life, things that um, behave slowly, grow and evolve slowly. Uh, there's just not a lot of energy there. Um, coming down here, the nitrogen-rich atmosphere. Uh, let me... There, that is much like Earth, but on Earth, we have oxygen. And there's no free oxygen at Titan, and so it's really the oxygen in that nitrogen-rich atmosphere um, that gives us abundant life here. So, correct answer is B. Now, that's Titan. We've talked about its atmosphere, its surface. There's another moon here named Enceladus. It's much farther out. And it's known to have plumes of salty ice and water that shoot out like geysers. So we've talked a little bit about planetary surfaces, and you've looked at quite a few. So I want you to use that knowledge to predict where you think these geysers would come out. Uh, up here in the heavily cratered region A, um, here in B in this smooth terrain, or C down here where it's both smooth and there's these dark linear features. You can see those here. So... Again, push pause and take a moment to think about this on your own. All right. Well, the correct answer here is that it's C uh, along the South Pole region. So we know that no craters equals or means that it is a very young surface. And we've talked about how cryovolcanism would smooth out a surface. It would resurface it, it may deposit ice crystals over the top, but cryovolcanism would erase craters. So it would either be in B and C. So if you picked either one of those, that's a good guess. It turns out that it's in C. What these long linear features are, what we call the tiger stripes. These are cryovolcanic vents. So they're like ice geysers. They, um, and they're about five to ten degrees warmer than the surrounding areas. 
So there's heat coming out of there, and that's all of these stripey features. Let me change my color real quick. These stripes down here are called the tiger stripes, and we see heat coming out of those if we do infrared maps. Um, and we also see um, plumes of ice and water, and we've detected salts in those. So here's another picture of Enceladus. Uh, here's a zoom in down here of the south polar terrain, and you can actually see the geysers coming right out of there. This is backlit by the sun. This is an actual image from Cassini, and you can see these plumes. And there's been mapping that done, that's that been done to map where these individual plumes are at, and they match up almost exactly with the tiger stripes on the surface. So it's pretty cool. Now this is a very unexpected result. Um, we never thought we would see something like this. Um, so this is a tiny moon and it has, it's unusually geologically active. Now it's very far from Saturn. And if you remember back to our discussion of Jupiter and its moons, as we got farther and farther from Saturn, the tides get weaker, weaker so there's less tidal heating. And also there are no resonances with nearby moons. That's another tidal effect that can heat these. And so we really didn't expect, um, especially didn't expect Enceladus to have any sort of subsurface ocean, which it almost certainly does if there is salt in the water. If there's salt in these plumes, it means that there is at some point a rock water interface where salt is dissolving into the liquid. And so we think that there is a layer of rock down there with an ocean on top of it, with ice on top of that. And again, very, very unexpected. So let me just put on here, these are the salty ice water eruptions, often called plumes. Um, another piece here is that we see silica. So these are just little rock crystals. And silica comes in different forms. You can have amorphous silica, where it's just kind of clumped together, or you can have crystalline silica. And the crystalline silica only forms at high temperatures. And so we think that that probably means that there are some volcanic vents down at the bottom of the ocean that's um, letting out not only heat, perhaps melting the ocean, but also providing some chemicals to the water. Um, and in particular, these silica crystals. The last thing here is, uh, again, because this is un unexpected, it really challenges what we should expect to see with these moons, not just here at Saturn, but farther out in the solar system, and even as we look um, elsewhere in the solar system. And it might not be global habitability. You can see in the north part of this moon um, is very old. There's lots of craters uh, up in this region here. There's very little um, cryovolcanic activity. Um, it seems to be only localized here, mostly in the South Pole. And so maybe this ocean is not global, like we see at Europa, but only in part of the moon. And so this may mean that there are zones of habitability. That maybe we don't need the whole planet, perhaps just a region could be habitable. So really changing how we think about this. Here's the last moon we're going to talk about, and this is the moon Triton, and this is a moon of Neptune, and it was likely captured um, by looking at the orbit of the moon. Uh, it goes in the wrong direction, a retrograde orbit. Um, and also its composition. It doesn't look like a moon so much as it looks like a Kuiper Belt object, like Pluto. So it looks more like Pluto than one of these icy moons, and it has some strange terrain on it. It's got this cantaloupe terrain um, where it's clearly not cratered. Something's going on there. We don't really know. 
there might be frost deposits, which indicates that there might be some cryovolcanism going on. Um, it may even have some sort of very weak atmosphere as we're seeing wind streaks, um, stuff being blown around on the surface. So very um, strange, enigmatic moon. Um, again, we never would have expected something this far out in the solar system to have enough heat. Um, but yeah, it's got this, like I said, cantaloupe terrain, and they just call it that because it looks a little bit like the surface of a cantaloupe. Um, as we've talked about a lot, that indicates that it's a young um, surface because there's no craters on it. Uh, what process is resurfacing it and giving it these features? We don't really know. Um, being so far from the sun, um, being around a much smaller planet than Jupiter of Saturn, so Neptune's much smaller than either one of those, um, there's really no identifiable heating mechanism. So the tides, um, the tidal forces are very weak here. And so we don't know, maybe there's heat left over from when it was captured, um, through that energetic process of capturing it. Maybe there was a lot of tides going on. Uh, maybe there's radioactive decay from when it formed. So we, we really don't know here. Um, but I think what it points to is that the possibility of a subsur subsurface ocean exists, exists, and we're six times farther from the sun than Pluto. If you looked at the sun from out at Uranus, um, sorry, at Neptune, it would just look like a bright star in the sky. You wouldn't even be able to really see it as a round object. Uh, it would be dim. Um, yeah, but what this is pointing at is that these icy moons with subsurface oceans might be common. I mean, we see them all over our own solar system, so they might be common in other solar systems as well. So as we're going out and looking for life in the universe, uh, we may not want to direct our attention only to planets, uh, but we may look at, um, well, I should say terrestrial planets, but we may also look at giant planets and, and their moons. Uh, as we've just talked about, the moons of the outer solar system seem to be the only place other than Earth that have abundant liquid water currently, other than maybe Mars. And there's a lot more energy than we thought there would be. So, um, yeah, I think that's about it for that slide. Let's talk about a little bit about chemical equations here. So we're going to talk for a second just about chemical equilibria. So this is a chemical reaction that I just sort of picked at random. And what this is looking at is we can take two hydrogens, combine it with an oxygen, and it makes H2O. This is basically burning hydrogen. Now, normally we think about this reaction as going from right to left. So normally goes from, sorry, left to right. That's how we typically think of this process, but that's because we have lots of oxygen in our atmosphere. And when we run this, we usually add a bunch of hydrogen. So this left side is weighted very heavily. What this arrow means is that the reaction can go both directions. It's reversible. And so water can actually split into hydrogens and oxygens. And we do this to make uh, hydrogen for hydrogen fueled cars and things like that. Um, but given the right conditions, this is completely reversible and it can really go either way. So on this side, these are what we call the reactants. And this is called the product. Now that's rather arbitrary since it can go either way. I could write this reaction in the other direction. Now the whole idea here is that the reaction's only gonna go one way if it's not in equilibrium, the system. So in equilibrium, what this means chemically in equilibrium, the rate of 
making products is equal to the rate of making reactants. So the reaction is going in the forward direction and the backward direction uh, at the same rate. Now that doesn't mean there's the same amount of these things. What we're thinking about is the rate. What this does mean though is that whatever amount we have, so we always have the same amount of reactants and products. Now they're not equal to each other, but let's say we have one gram of this stuff, we'll always have one gram of that stuff. And if we have 100 grams of this, we'll always have 100 grams of water. So that the rate at which we're making new water is the same as it's the rate that we're destroying water. So we're making this at the same rate we're making that, so that we always have the same amount of water present, we always have the same amount of um, hydrogen and oxygen present. So this is what we call chemical equilibria. And nature always tries, nature always naturally moves to equilibrium. Now, equilibrium is not a very exciting state. Um, it's really disequilibrium that gives us energy and reactions. So we want to be in disequilibrium. That's good. And we often get that um, geologically. So if we were to have way too many of these reactants, if we're in disequilibrium, then it would naturally make a lot of water, and as this reaction moves to the right, it's an exothermic reaction. It gives off lots of heat and energy. So again, this happens a lot. A good example of this are the hot, cold water interfaces near deep sea vents. So the having the hot and cold is a thermal disequilibrium, but that can also lead to chemical disequilibriums. One way you can think about it is that these vents are releasing heat, but they're also releasing lots and lots of chemicals. And if you have a higher amount of chemicals near the vent and less chemicals as you get farther away, that'll create a chemical disequilibrium and animals can uh, get energy from that. Plants can too, I guess. It's really just energy for life. So disequilibria is good for life. All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about here are redox reactions. So in redox reactions, um, what is exchanged between elements in the reaction to transfer charge? So think about this quietly on your own for a moment. Hopefully you know this from the reading. So the correct answer here is electrons. Remember the protons are all locked in the nucleus. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen are neutral. This is locked in nucleus, so it can't participate. Electrons are the negative charge carriers. This is stuff we talked about way back at the beginning of the semester. And they carry charge from one reactant to another. So that reduces the charge in one and oxidizes the other reactant. And so that's where this gets its name, this redox is short for reduction and whoops oxidization 
Okay, so you'll notice this oxygen here. These are the energetic reactions we've been talking about with regard to oxygen. Some common things you're probably familiar with as far as redox reactions are rusting. This is a slow process, but anytime things burn, so rusting, burning, and metabolism, both um, photosynthesis and respiration. So what plants and animals do, uh, all of those things are redox reactions. Very common, very energetic reactions. So just to wrap this up a little bit, these are the backbone or the primary reaction of most um, energy generating metabolic reactions. We just talked about that a little bit. I just want to remind you that we talked about the rise of oxygen and how it led to complex life forms because it had more energy. Well, these are the energies, these are the reactions that oxygen was able to do that led to these complex life forms. And so these reactions, you don't need oxygen for them, but they, it was sort of the most common um, way people studied it at first, and so they named it after oxygen, even though many other reactions without oxygen um, are redox reactions. So this can provide energy for life in the subsurface oceans, so even though we don't have oxygen down there, these redox reactions can happen. So these would be redox reactions without oxygen. We don't need it. And there are actually um, these reactions happening at rock water interfaces at the bottom of the ocean. So where we have chemical disequilibrium, we can get redox reactions and that can support life. And if we're seeing it there, um, we might see it elsewhere. So it could be powering life elsewhere in the universe, sort of a wrap up if it happens here, it could happen elsewhere. So these um, icy moons in the outer part of the solar system get very little sunlight for energy. They don't have abundant oxygen for energy, but these types of reactions that are named after oxygen, redox reactions, can provide life energy they do so here on Earth, down at the Black Smokers. Um, one thing you need for these redox reactions to be able to provide energy is a chemical disequilibrium. So the last two things we talked about here when put together can and do provide energy for life in places with little sunlight or oxygen. All right, so that's about it for today. Um, please stay up on, on top of the reading. Uh, thanks for your continued participation in the course. I have finished grading all of the exams. If you have any questions on those, please let me know. And I think that's it. Take care. Have a wonderful day. And please take care of yourselves.